Okay, this is Chapter 5 of the American Government Course. We're going to be talking about Congress, and we've got quite a bit to talk about here on this session. And I typically take two full lectures in the classroom to talk about this, so we're going to go ahead and go through it all here in one session. What we'll notice here is that um, we're in the 116th session of Congress. Congress is re-elected every two years. So we're currently in the 116th session. The House of Representatives, of course, is up for re-election every two years. The entire House is up for re-election, and one-third of the Senate is up for re-election. So therefore, we've got a new session that starts every two years, and then we'll have the 117th session of Congress starting in January of 2021. So let's talk briefly about the primary goals of the members of Congress. The first goal, of course, we have to talk about is getting reelected. Unfortunately, this may sound a little bit cynical, but the incentives for getting reelected are numerous as a congressman. And a lot of them are psychological, just like for you and me, we want to keep our jobs. We want to be well liked at our jobs, particularly in Congress, when if you're a member of the House of Representatives, You've only got a two-year term. In today's climate, not much can get done in two years. So you're spending a lot of your time getting reelected so you can build that seniority. The seniority is very important in Congress because that will get you more prestigious committee assignments. We can't ignore the fact that re-election is, in our system, the way it's designed, is very important priority. However, we, we also have to deal with the trade-off of a lot of counterproductive activity gets put into getting reelected when we have lots of problems that could be addressed. And that leads me to their perhaps most important, theoretically, goal is to make the laws. They are the policymakers. According to the uh, Federalist Paper Number 10, the legislative branch necessarily predominates because they are making the laws. The root of our society is the laws that we make. A very important goal, but it has to compete with getting reelected. And of course, another goal is because it's a very prestigious job, that people will listen to congressmen, whether you agree with them or not. They attract quite a large audience. Primary functions of Congress, we've talked about this already in our overview of the Constitution. Congressmen and women are our representatives in this republic, this Republican form of government. And they legislate, they pass laws. Another thing that we've talked about, which was very strongly implied in the Constitution, advise and consent is also a kind of an offshoot of this. But oversight is the power that Congress has to keep an eye on the executive branch. We have this separation of power. Congress makes the laws, but then once those laws get passed, then they get moved over to the executive branch, who has the, the uh, responsibility for implementing those laws out into society and enforcing those laws how they see fit. So that's part of that very important separation of powers. But... Congress also has the obligation to keep an eye on them, and so they have the power to subpoena witnesses where they can bring in people that uh, can testify before congressional hearings to try to figure out what's going on, what happened, what went wrong, and things like that. And then, of course, another function of Congress is the power to impeach the president or a Supreme Court justice. We do know that that's broken up into sections to where the House of Representatives is tasked with the indictment or filing the charges, and then the trial is held in the Senate. Let's talk a little bit about the House of Representatives in particular. We'll look at some maps here in a minute, but there's 435 members in the U.S. House of Representatives, and that's one congressman per district. That was set up in the Constitution. This is what we call single-member districts. 
We'll get into more about those later on when we talk about elections. They are elected once every two years. So that can, like I said, that could be potentially problematic in today's polarized climate that you're you're barely there long enough to figure out where the congressional bathrooms are and then you're up for re-election. So they do spend a lot of time and energy making sure that they're going to get elected, which is somewhat ironic when, when we talk about the power of incumbency here in a minute. Now, the House of Representatives, of course, is the proportional section of Congress where membership varies per state by population. The more populated states have more representatives. We'll look at those numbers later on. That also determines how many uh, electoral college voters that they have as well. But we're looking, uh, since the 2010 census, we're looking at a, districts were designed to have a little over 700,000 people per district, and one representative gets elected for each out of each of those uh, districts. In the 2020 Senate census, we may up that a little bit, depending on what our new population is, but we will remain. They have retained this number, 435, but as long as we don't add any more states, it will cap at 435. So therefore, in the 2020 census, this number may go up a little bit as far as number of people per district that will elect their representative. Now, the House is bigger and obviously has potential for more turnover, and obviously they have smaller territory, so the members tend to have localized, a little bit more narrow constituencies in general. You know, obviously, some big states have very small populations, but in general, the House needs to be a little bit more organized. There's more centralized authority. The party whips the majority leaders of the party, those are the ones that are planning it out. And we do have in the House of Representatives what is called a rules committee that the Senate does not have that really sets the agenda for debates and amendments on bills. So quite a bit more organized and orderly moving along, a little bit more uh, restrictions on their their time and their freedom to say and, and do what they want to do in the House, perhaps out of necessity because it's a it's a bigger group. Now let's look at some maps here. This is the state of New Jersey, and New Jersey has 12 U.S. congressional districts with one representative elected out of each of these districts, and that was based on the 2010 census. These were drawn such that there's about 700 plus thousand people in each one of these districts. Now let's focus on a couple of districts. Let's look at district number nine right here in New Jersey. So zooming in on that a little bit, looks kind of like a bat. This is the ninth district. Bill Pasquale is the House of Representatives a member that is elected from this district in New Jersey and goes to the U.S. House in Washington. I picked this one because uh, I live, this is my district, or my hometown is over here. Now let's look at another one. This is the 5th Congressional District. Josh Gottheimer is the representative from this district. This is in the, the upper northwest corner of New Jersey. Looking at this one because, just for an example, the Bergen Community College Paramus campus is here in this particular district. Interestingly enough, prior to the last midterm election in 2018, New Jersey was somewhat unique in that it had six Republicans and six Democrats making up its 12 congressional members. But in the 2018 midterm elections, there was quite a shift. Now there are 11 Democrats and only one Republican. So you could clearly say that New Jersey shifted even more blue in the 
2018 midterm elections. Now looking at the nationwide, we know that in the 2018 midterms, there was a complete shift from Republican control to Democratic control of the House. Since the 2018 midterm elections, we've got 235 Democrats. They hold a clear majority, which gives them advantage in passing bills in their favor in the House. 198 Republicans. Now you can see how there's a lot of red territory here, and that's the uh, districts that are controlled by a Republican representative. So you can see there there's some clear trends that the more populated coastal areas, this has some logic to it. Larger metropolitan, er metropolitan areas have people that are more densely packed in together. They have to have uh, law and order. They have There's more interaction. You might tend to see more liberal attitudes in these more larger growing populated metropolis areas, which makes logical sense. In the rural areas, more spread out, probably less need for uh, centralized control out in the rural or smaller towns. You may go months without even seeing a cop or a sheriff. So that has some logic to it. Now looking at the Senate, we have 100 senators, and that's two per state, elected by popular vote statewide. The Senate is considered the, the more prestigious house. For example, if a House of Representatives member wanted to uh, run for Senate, that would be somewhat of an upgrade or promotion. You very rarely see senators running for the House because it's a six-year term, and uh, it's a statewide office, obviously a little bit more prestige and power with this Senate. Now, the six-year term, as far as their elections with each midterm election, they're staggered. So one-third of the Senate is up for re-election every two years. So they, they do that so that they can spread it out so that there's not an overwhelming number of senators that are just, by coincidence, up for re-election. They, they intentionally spread that out. Part of what the Great Compromise was about that perhaps even saved the Constitutional Convention because the smaller states were not happy with a proportional representation system that they would be very powerless and they may get squeezed out and the Senate will be represented equally. So regardless of how small your state is or how low populated your state is, you will still have two senators. Now, because of the Senate is a smaller body and uh, more prestige, they and they have a broader constituency. There are statewide constituencies. What we see here is the Senate is a little bit less organized and more individualistic, where the senators have a little bit more leeway to talk longer and say what they need to say. You can probably see that difference in if you watch C-SPAN, where they may be showing a, some hearings or, well, particularly when we're on the chamber floor is where you'll see the difference. Where the House of Representatives, they have short time limits. Whereas in the Senate, they can literally stand up there and talk as long as they want. There's very rarely any time limits on the Senate in order for their debate, in order to hash out these bills. Also, as a result, the Senate came up in the late 1800s, with this concept of the filibuster, this was not in the Constitution. This came up perhaps as a result of a minority party feeling like that they were getting railroaded because they did not have much say in the majority party's ability to get legislation kind of rammed through the door. So the filibuster allows the minority party to invoke this uh, cloture rule that then requires a three-fifths vote in order to overcome that. So technically, and we'll talk a little bit more about this filibuster, because now in our very polarized climate, the minority party uses the filibuster on a regular basis in order to force the majority party to get 60 votes in order to get that proposal going. 
And that's very difficult to do if you only have, for example, 52, or in this case, 53 senators majority. It's very difficult to find seven more senators from the other side of the aisle to come on your side in order to proceed with that proposal. So it's become a very big stumbling block to uh, get things done. And we may see some rule changes down the road on this filibuster in order to try to get more things addressed uh, that were sorely in need of addressing in our U.S. society. And our Congress has been quite unproductive over the past decade or more. Here's the, uh, the map of the Senate. The red states have two Republican senators. Blue states have two Democrat senators. And you could probably guess that the pinstripe states have one Republican and one Democrat. And we see that in Maine, we also have an independent senator. Now, looking at some demographics here, this actually is also in the book on page 126. You can see that our system of Congress is not really representative of our population of the United States. As you can see, particularly in, uh, in the Senate, when you look at representation of, of minorities, extremely small representation, particularly of blacks and of women. Now, this was the 115th Congress, and we've seen it just in the 2018 election, which is, which is putting us in the 116th Congress. We see some interesting improvements here. But now, of course, in the House, the numbers for blacks is significantly higher, but not any better for women representation. Looking at the, the 116th Congress, looking at women in particular, we see that there was one of the biggest jumps ever in women and female representation. So what we saw in the 2018 mid midterms was a record number of women running for Congress. And that bumped us up to about one-fourth, <laughs> still uh, quite a bit behind the 50% uh, of the actual population. Because of the fact that the Congress is very polarized, they're tasked with making the laws, but it's very difficult for them to, uh, to get much done. And that's the reason why we've seen an increase of power of the president through his executive actions. And we've also seen an increased activity of the Supreme Court deciding things for us because Congress is becoming increasingly unproductive. And that provides a lot of ammunition for political cartoonists as well. And uh, here's one speaking of building a wall. Well, looks like we've got somewhat of a um, symbolic wall there between parties there in Congress. Just a never-ending source of, of political sarcasm and, and satire as far as being able to address major problems that are facing us, much less solving them. And this is where I encourage students quite a bit to, we need to pay attention to this. We need to hold them accountable because you've got lots of things that you are facing in your future that will need to be addressed. And speaking of which, that Congress has considerable difficulty getting things done, well, their approval ratings have been steadily declining and they've kind of leveled out around 20% are below. So that's pretty remarkable that only about 17% of Americans actually approve of the job that Congress is doing. Now, there's a significant spike right here. We'll talk about that later on. And that's what we call a rally around the flag effect where right after 9-11, we were all of a sudden very much on the same page of how great our government was. And look at the approval ratings. But as you can see, once that uh, patriotic effect starts to wear off, well, then boom, 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 we're right back down to what we're saying. But particularly since the uh, mid-2000s there, pretty much 15 years, we've seen pretty dismal approval ratings 
of Congress, and they've become increasingly po polarized, and it's becoming less and less able to address major issues that need to be addressed. So that brings up a question. Considering these dismal approval ratings, what is the typical probability that a congressman will get reelected? Now, the, uh, there's a chart on page 131 that shows you that. The bottom line is, is that they have over a 90% re-election rate. It's close to 98% in the House, around 90% in the Senate. So that's a very interesting contrast. Their approval ratings hovers below 20%, but yet their chance of getting re-elected is well over 90%. So you would ask yourself, what's wrong with this picture? How can this occur? That's what we call the power of incumbency. The incumbent is the person that's already in office. So let's touch on that a little bit. A lot of it is psychological. Name recognition is extremely important. Once you know a person's name, then you're familiar with that person. And even if people go to the voting booth and don't have any idea who's running for what, if they see a name that they already recognize, or, you know, and since we do know that people are typically voting for a party, well, then they're going to vote for the, the name that they already know in their party. Fundraising, they already have an advantage if they're in office. Once they're in office, they already have what is called a war chest. And, of course, they can't spend that for anything other than re-election needs. And since re-election is one of their major goals, well, then... They can continue to raise money while they're in office for their re-election campaign. A lot of contributors also know that they have a, a big chance of getting re-elected, so they're also going to collect a majority of those campaign re-election funds because they're already in office, and so people are also kind of betting that they're the most likely candidate, so I'm going to give them my money instead of some unknown challenger. This early money can scare off some uh, pretty credible challengers, but they're already far behind because of this money advantage. Now, the fact that it need, that we, or at least we perceive that we need a lot of money to get elected, that's something that we'll address a little bit more later on because it's becoming more and more of a growing perception that you need more and more money to get reelected. And we may be just convincing ourselves of that, and, of course, a lot of this money is used for campaign advertising, particularly negative advertising, which seems to be more effective on our System 1 brains. Now, you're also, if you're on the job, you're going to be automatically getting more media coverage, particularly for committee assignments. And we've also seen some examples there that there's been some senators who have been relatively unknown, and, and then when they get televised on a committee, a very high profile committee where they get to, uh, they get some media coverage and then the next thing you know, they're running for president because of that media coverage. Particularly if you're running for re-election in Congress, well, the committee activity is going to give you a lot of free press. Now, this may not sound like much, but if you're a member of Congress, you can also mail for free. Considering how much it would cost somebody to mail a postcard to every single person in your state, that could add up. Well, a sitting senator or a sitting congressman can do that at no cost. So that does provide yet another advantage. Another thing that incumbents have is the ability to go back to their districts and, and do casework, get more exposure in their district by just their, their hands-on communication with people in their district. That's going to give them a little bit more name recognition and goodwill. The idea of bringing leg legislative projects back to your district, and this is has some negative connotations to it. It's fairly controversial. It's called pork barrel legislation or earmark spending to where congressmen will insert riders into bills that will provide improvements to their state or to their district. Now, gerrymandering is something we'll touch on a little bit more. Every 10 years, we have a new census. So therefore, the legislative districts have to be redrawn. According to that delegation that we talked about in the Constitution, 
that a very important delegation that each state is responsible for their own elections. So therefore, each state legislature has to draw those districts. So the Congress says that we have one representative per district, and of course it's also mandated that they have to be evenly proportioned. So therefore, the state legislatures are therefore tasked every 10 years to redraw those U.S. congressional districts based on what the new population may be per district. And therefore, the party that has the majority is also going to have the advantage to get their mapping plan passed. And they can manipulate these boundaries in such a way that they can maximize their ability to get reelected. And it does work. And we'll talk about some examples here in a minute. We also know that low, ver low voter turnout does contribute to the incumbent getting reelected. Same old, same old. Because if you had a much larger turnout, you'd have much more potential for a variety or a shakeup of who might potentially get elected in that, in that particular district. Here's another chart that shows the overwhelming probability of getting reelected. As you can see in the U.S. House, it's been fairly consistent, well into the 90% range as far as getting reelected. And in the Senate, we also see, particularly in the past 30 years or so, clearly about a 90%, close to about a 90% reelection rate. So that shows you how much power the incumbent has. It probably does also show you how we are kind of psychologically geared to, to name recognition and things like that. Here's some examples of potentially gerrymandered districts. Here is the 7th Congressional District in Pennsylvania. This is one district. This is where the state legislature drew this district in such a convoluted manner in order to try to either maximize their party's re-election chances or to minimize the number of opposition party members that would get re-elected. Here's another district in Maryland. This is one district where a representative, one representative is elected from this district in, in Maryland. Gerrymandering has is, is found its way to the Supreme Court on several occasions, and the Supreme Court almost always punts it back into the state because the state has the jurisdiction to draw these. We see that the Republicans have been using gerrymandering a little bit more effectively over the past years. We'll look at some numbers there. They uh, may be resistant to reform on that. Speaking of incumbency advantage here, in this particular election in 2016, the Assemblyman won re-election with 60% of the vote despite the fact that he was facing fraud charges. Oh, and by the way, he also died four days before the election. So that shows you how powerful the incumbent is to getting reelected. Here's some examples of gridlock that we've been dealing with, particularly in the last decade or more. The filibuster has been used dramatically more just in the last 15 years. We see that during Franklin Roosevelt's 12-year term, the Senate used the filibuster only six times in that entire 12-year period. So that was certainly not the norm to filibuster. As we start getting into the modern era of more and more polarization, that in particular, the Republican minority used it 218 times in that one two-year period. So you can see that it's become somewhat of, of a tool, a political tool used on a regular basis to try to prevent the majority party from passing legislation. Now, as I mentioned before, gerrymandering works quite effectively. There's numerous examples. Here's just one of many. In 2012, the Republicans maintained a 33-seat advantage in the House despite receiving 1.4 million fewer votes than the Dem Democrats uh, collectively. So that shows you how if you can strategically draw those districts in order to maximize your chances of maintaining that majority, 
it actually does work. And we'll look at some numbers here in a minute. The 112th and 113th Congresses were the least productive in modern history. And we'll, we'll see that the last couple of, of sessions have not been significantly better. As we can see right here, going to the 113th district here down on the bottom, you can see how much it's dramatically declined. As we look here back in the 50s and 60s, 22,000 bills introduced with 1,200 passed. Then we look as we get into the 2000, it dwindles dramatically. And by the time we get to the 113th district, only a fraction of that number of bills have been introduced. And as you can see, only 223 passed. And most of those are of a ceremonial nature where they're not really addressing major issues that need to be looked at in U.S. society. Now, keep in mind, I am a firm believer in that old saying that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But there's no way that you can convince me that there, that there are not major issues that we are facing, that you are facing in your future, that would need to be addressed. We're going to have to look at this increasing polarization in our Congress, making them increasingly less productive when they are most definitely in need of solving some problems. Here's just a little bar chart that shows you how the filibuster has just exploded. The number of times that the filibuster was invoked as we get up to the 109th Congress, it spikes again as we get into the 2000s. But then when we hit the 113th Congress, this is where the Republicans were faced with being the minority. And then they blew it off the chart here in the number of times that they used the filibuster. And then since that time, both parties have used it liberally in order to try to block the majority party from getting anything passed. Now let's talk about how things get done in Congress when they do get done. And most of the work done in Congress is through committees. These are the workhorses. This is where all the fine tuning and the details and all the bills get ironed out. They, they have to get them pretty much in as close to final form as they can get them before it goes out there on the, the chamber floor because once it gets out on the chamber floor, they just have to debate over the basics and add amendments here and there. So there are several standing committees in each of the houses, and there's quite a bit of committees that are the same type of committee. They may be named different. The standing committees are on page 136 in the book. So, for example, you've got an agricultural committee in the House. In the Senate, they actually call it the Agricultural Nutrition and Forestry Committee. A agricultural bill would be addressed by that committee in those houses. We also see in the, the House you have what is called the Foreign Affairs Committee, and in the Senate they call it the Foreign Relations Committee. So they would handle similar types of issues. Now this is another reason why it's important for congressmen to get re-elected and build up seniority and prestige. And it's also another reason, as we'll talk about here at the tail end of this lecture, is why it's why the political party is so important for them to maintain their power. Because once the party gets a majority, it determines all the chairpersons of all these committees. As we saw in the House, when the House flipped in 2018, to the Democratic Party, well then the Democratic Party determined who the chairpersons were of each of those committees. And that provided them a very important gatekeeping function. So that means nothing really is going to get out of that committee unless that party approves of it. So that's why getting the majority of that particular chamber is very important to these political parties because it gives them a lot of that gatekeeping power and they obviously have the advantage of getting legislation passed that's favorable to their ideology. That's just kind of how it works to our uh, human nature and uh, may be counterproductive at times, but that's kind of how it works. Now let's talk a little bit about how a bill becomes a law. The bill is first introduced, typically introduced by one of the members of Congress, but the ideas come from anywhere. 
And then the first thing, it's referred to a committee. And then, of course, then it could get referred to a subcommittee for more detailed work there. This is where they would study it, bring in witnesses, so the work is done. Much of the work in our democracy is done behind closed doors. Now, occasionally they will have hearings on these bills in order to bring people to testify as to what they would recommend or that uh, bill. This is where you get a lot of the executive branch coming in to give their input or interest groups are most heavily involved in trying to get their influence in on that bill. This is where lobbyists do most of their work. They're working hand in hand with those congressmen that are working on that bill in that committee, trying to get their input into that bill. Then that committee has tasks to recommend that bill or not, and then they send it out to the chamber floor. This is where the party, the majority party, will have that gatekeeping power because the chairman of that committee is also a member of the majority party, and he's not going to let it out of that committee unless the party is okay with it. Now, what we see is that close to 90% of all proposed bills don't even make it out of committee. So this is where the bulk of the work gets done. Clearly, in our system, something could be hot at the moment. It goes into committee. Then it becomes perhaps not as hot, and it just kind of fades away and dies, or that they can't come to an agreement on there, and then it becomes perhaps less of a priority so that's just why in our society, when, when something's extremely hot that needs to get done, well, you've got a better chance of hopefully getting it done, getting it out of committee, and then hopefully getting a bill passed. But anyway, this is step one, where the bulk of the work gets done. Now, once it gets out of the committee, it goes to the floor where the chamber members debate on it and add amendments. And as I said, in the House, you have the Rules Committee that really kind of sets the agenda, determines how much time is going to be allotted for the debate because there's lots of people in there and how many amendments could potentially be added. So it's fairly well structured. In the Senate, not quite as structured. The majority and minority leaders determine the schedule, but uh, there's really not a whole lot of time limits on debate. And this is where the filibuster has become more and more common. Whenever the minority party invokes that filibuster, then the majority party has to look to try to get 60 votes to stop that. Otherwise, they're right back to the drawing board or that bill gets killed and they have to start over again. If they can amass 60 votes, then it continues on. It could potentially get passed. So step number two, floor for debate. Step number three is very short and sweet. And simple, that just simply means that each house has passed their version of the bill. So typically, if it's a major issue, both houses are working on that issue with their respective committees. And then it goes into their respective houses, and they try to come up with a final, or at least a version of their bill. And these typically are passed by a majority, but as I said, sometimes the Senate may require a supermajority, particularly if that filibuster is invoked. The fourth is a little bit more complicated. This is called the conference stage, where both of those versions from each of the houses have to be reconciled in what is called the conference committee. The conference committee is made up of people from both parties and both houses. They have to put those two bills together into one version. And once they do that, then that, that sole version, the combined version, now has to be approved by both houses. So this is what the framers intended for both houses to kind of be together on the same page. So therefore, once both houses approve that reconciled or that combined version, it's good to go to the final stage. That's where it is approved by the president who signs it into law. If the president does not sign it, then that veto can be overridden by two-thirds vote of both houses, which does not occur very often because it's very difficult for two-thirds 
of a congressman to agree. The book does have a little bit more of a detailed flow chart of how this bill becomes a law on page 139, but for testing purposes, I've condensed it into these five steps that should be a little bit easier to remember as far as this progression for a bill to become a law. Now, the last thing I want to talk about for this chapter is focusing on three groups of people that influence policy making. Now, here, keep in mind, I'm not talking about getting reelected. I'm talking about making policy, making law. So we're going to talk about the constituents, which ironically do not really have very much influence on policy making. And then we're going to talk a little about interest groups would have that have a lot of influence, and of course the political parties which have a tremendous amount of influence on policy making. So let's talk about those three groups. Now, like I said, the constituents, these are the people that live in the congressman's district. Now, they are obviously vital for him to get reelected, him or her. But uh, we also know that the incumbent has an overwhelming probability of getting reelected. So therefore, constituents don't have that much influence on a congressman in making policy. He knows he's got a really good chance of getting reelected. Also knows that the typical constituent is not that well informed on the details of the policy. This is where rational ignorance plays a part, where... Yes, I may be a very smart, intelligent person, but I don't really have time to delve into the details of policy. I, that's what I elect you to do. You do that and give me a good bill and make our world a better place. So that's being rationally ignorant. Plus the public, the attentive public is pretty small. So the Congress can also use polls, but the Congress typically knows how much power his party has or how much his district leans in his favor so he can anticipate their policy views. So this is, again, somewhat ironic that the constituents who actually are going to be benefiting from policy don't really have a whole lot of influence on the policy that gets passed. Now, interest groups have a lot of influence, and I'm going to be talking quite a bit more about interest groups later on. So what I want to do here is just introduce you to interest groups, and there's thousands of interest groups in America. Corporations and professional associations make up the vast majority of interest groups because they have more direct economic interest in policy getting passed in their favor. So what we are looking at here is people organizing in order to get benefits. And since corporations are already organized and they know that increasing their profit is their their main target, well, therefore, they can have quite a bit of influence because they're very focused and they have uh, deeper pockets in order to try to spend money that would try to help a congressman pass policy that benefits them. Now, we're going to talk a, a lot more detail later on on how that works. Interest groups have the ability to mobilize followers, to recruit members, to collect dues, to raise funds that they can use in order to make campaign contributions that congressmen like and need. And they don't forget those things. They're not going to acknowledge it, but they certainly won't forget it. The political action committees are also organized to increased fundraising. And so what the lobbyists do, and these are people that are hired or contracted by interest groups, and we've got lots of what we would call promotional type groups out there, such as the NRA and the ARP and the ACLU that are also in the NAACP that are also trying to influence government policy. But they all can hire lobbyists who work hand in hand with congressmen in order to try to get those bills geared towards benefits, towards our group. And that's very rational human behavior for people to organize into, into groups of people that have similar 
wants and needs, similar interests, and therefore they can come together and put pressure on congressmen to pass laws that are going to help me out. That's one, one reason why they're called pressure groups. So interest groups very much influential on policy making when it comes to ironing out details that go into the bills the interest groups can hire people with very uh, detailed expertise on these that can help the congressman put that in the bill again this expertise and information that lobbyists and interest group can provide they are actually helping craft that legislation to where congressmen may not be as well informed on that issue as the lobbyist is so this is where we have to keep an eye on it because we hire, technically we hire our congressmen to pass that law for us, so we have to rely on their judgment that they're passing the best bill despite the fact that they've got lobbyists hitting them from all sides wanting that legislation to help their group. Now the party is also very influential in uh, policy making because the party that gets majority of that house is going to be able to call the shots. If the party has got loyalty and discipline, therefore, if they know if all of their members are all together on the same page and we've got the majority, bingo. That's what we need in order to get legislation passed that agrees with our view of the world. We want legislation that conforms to our conservative ideology or our liberal leaning ideology and if we have the majority and if we have that solidarity where all our members are on the same page we are going to get legislation passed that we want because now we have all the chairmen of all of the committees and now we have that gatekeeping of power so that means the bill's not even going to make it to the floor unless our party's okay with it. So this is extremely important as to why the party that gets the majority, this is why there's so much effort that's made to get reelected and to keep that majority, probably at the detriment of getting anything done. So clearly some of you guys might want to get out there and get smart on this stuff and, and think about how we might be able to reform the system to make it a little bit more productive because when so much effort is spent to get reelected and to maintain that majority, well, you know, it's a trade-off because the party that gets that majority is going to have the advantage to getting bills passed that agree with their ideology. The, the whip system is also part of this process. Each party whip is the, the whip is the second highest ranking member of that party. And the whip is responsible for making sure that all the members are in line. You know, just like a, a trail boss whipping the herd in, in line there. He corrals the members so that they're all on the same page. They're all in agreement. Rarely a vote is ever taken in either one of these houses of Congress where the uh, party does not know what the vote's going to be. So the, the whip is out there delivering messages and uh, making the deals and to, to make sure that everybody in that party is going to vote in line on that bill. Log rolling is where the deal making occurs. This deal making could occur within the party because there may be some party members that are looking for some things, looking for some benefits for their state, for their district. So they, they may want uh, the party to give them something in return later on in order to, to ensure their vote. Sometimes this deal making might even cross party lines in order to try to get to entice somebody from the other party to come over and vote with us on this particular bill. And if you do, we will repay you later on by supporting you on something that you want. So log rolling is also part of this process that the party uses to influence policy that's going to be in their ideological view. So those are the three groups of people that we've talked about that influence policy making. Constituents, not so much. However, interest groups and the party 
very much.